Be honest. When was the last time you thought about your current business insurance policy? If your existing business insurance policy is renewing on autopilot each year without checking out Zensurance, you're probably spending more than you need. That's why you need to switch to low-cost coverage from Zensurance before your policy renews this year. Zensurance does all the heavy lifting to find a policy, covering only what you need, and policies start at only $19 per month. So if your policy is renewing soon, go to Zensurance.com and buy your policy online in just a few minutes. Zensurance. Mind your business. Céline Dion. My dream to be international star. Could it happen again? Could Céline Dion happen again? I'm Thomas Leblanc, and Céline Understood is a four-part series from CBC Podcasts and CBC News, where I piece together the surprising circumstances that helped manufacture Céline Dion, the pop icon. Céline Understood, available wherever you get your podcasts. Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. If the entire online ecosystem feels like it's trying to scam you these days, well, you're not alone. And also, you're not wrong. The past few years have seen a truly seismic growth in the amount of money that Canadians have reported as lost to fraud. And most experts will tell you the money reported is just the tip of the iceberg. We are talking hundreds of millions of dollars here easily. Hundreds, if not thousands, of Canadians losing their entire life savings. That money is just vanishing, all but untraceable. And police forces are either ill-equipped or not focused enough to deal with the problem. So what kind of scams are we talking about here? Which are the most dangerous? Why haven't we been able, after literally years of this, to make prosecution possible in more than just a few cases? In short, how did this get so bad? How do we fix it? And how do you protect yourself until we do? I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Zach Veshra is a Vancouver-based journalist who focuses on white-collar crime, and he covered the rise in online fraud for the Investigative Journalism Foundation. Hello, Zach. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, you are most welcome. Uh, we have been looking for a while to do an episode about uh, the plethora of listeners we've had writing in uh, explaining different kinds of fraud to us. So I think this is a great place to start. I'm happy to tell your listeners, unfortunately, they are not alone. Well, at least we can arm them and arm ourselves. Why don't we start with a big picture here? As of the most recent data, how much money have Canadians lost to fraud? And how does that compare as we start going back a few years? The most recent information we have suggests that Canadians are losing a record sum of money to fraud. The Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre estimates that losses hit roughly $554 million last year in terms of what was reported to them. And I've got some bad news for you. The Fraud Centre also says that the vast majority of fraud is never reported to them or to anyone. Hmm. They say that their numbers could be as little as 5 to 10% of the actual total of fraud happening in Canada. But even based on that sliver of information... All indicators are that fraud is on the rise. In 2020, for example, the numbers they had were just 164 million. So we're talking about a trickling in just the space of three years. Why don't most Canadians report this kind of fraud? There's a few reasons why a huge one is shame. Yeah. Broadly speaking, if someone ran up on you, God forbid, and took your wallet, few people would blame you for that interaction. With fraud, there's often an element of deception. And victims are often ashamed to come forward and talk about the experience because they feel like they're at fault. There's also an element of practicality to it that you've already mentioned. Part of the story that we dug into is that the vast, vast majority of fraudsters, even for the crimes that are reported, are never criminally charged. And in many cases, police units are so overwhelmed that they don't really even have the ability to properly start these investigations. So a lot of fraud victims will either count the loss and move on. They'll seek some kind of retribution through the civil system, for example, the civil court system. 
they may hire a private investigator, but the vast majority of them are kind of this silent majority, if you would, of victims who are sort of suffering in silence. And we will talk about the challenges uh, of prosecuting this fraud, of recovering money or anything uh, like that a little bit later. But maybe first, because we keep talking about fraud, you know, I assume uh, this encompasses like cyber crimes and scams and those uh, text phone scams that people get. Give us a sense of the scope here when we talk about that half a billion dollars just reported lost to fraud. What are we talking about? There are so many flavors and types of fraud within these sort of typologies that you've laid out, right? You meant it's like an ice cream shop from hell. You talked about cyber fraud, for example. That can be anything from a spear phishing attempt. Someone sends you a dodgy email, uses it to hack your devices. That can be setting up a phony investment opportunity and getting someone to invest. That can be a dodgy Facebook marketplace ad where they're like, pay the money online and I'll give you the thing later. And it never actually happens. It can be people selling fake timeshares. But there's also evidence of an uptick in what we might call the more old school types of fraud too. There are still people embezzling money from employers or from businesses, for example. There are people who are selling fake products that never actually arrive. There are people doing things like mortgage fraud, for example, or title fraud is, is a kind of a new concern in places like Ontario. All this to say that there are a million ways to take your money and fraudsters are exploring every one of them. What has changed that we can identify uh, that might account for the increase? I mean, you mentioned 2020. Is this a pandemic thing? Is that just a coincidence? What's driving this? It's absolutely not a coincidence. If you go back a little bit, if you go back to, for example, 2013, Statistics Canada says that fewer than 80,000 reports of fraud came into to police agencies across the country in that year. And if you look at the most recent data, we're talking about more than a doubling of that. We're talking more than 170,000 reports. And a lot of that is because of the internet. People started moving online, fraudsters followed. They engineered new types of schemes targeting people online in this scheme that's sort of broadly referred to as cyber-enabled crime. Then comes COVID-19, 2020. People are suddenly spending a huge amount of time online. Businesses are moving online. There are big, fat government benefits that are up for grabs and that fraudsters are trying to get a hold of. Furthermore, Jordan, I don't, I don't know if you remember much about that period. People were really scared. Yeah. People were anxious. We had internal federal briefing notes that we acquired talking about some of the types of fraud going on in this time period. And a lot of it was people, for example, posing as a relative who needed help or a stranger who was isolated in a faraway country when travel was being shut down across the globe. There were even very popular scams selling fake pets. You remember the boom of people trying to adopt dogs? There were fraudsters who are pretending to offer dogs for adoption and there was no dog to pick up, which is Honestly, one of the more heartbreaking types of fraud that we've heard about, right? You can imagine someone's excitement and disappointment when that happens. But what this period really did for fraudsters is it was kind of a renaissance because it allowed, it basically showed them the possibilities of how far some of these online scams could go and how much social engineering could play into extracting someone's money. I talked to an investigator of the BC Securities Commission, and he said that he noticed at this time that fraudsters weren't just grabbing whatever they could and running off with it when they, for example, suckered someone into investing money. Suddenly, they were spending weeks or months building relationships with people online, sort of gently pulling them in to invest, taking as much as they could, and then running off with like huge sums of money, right? Another trend with fraud that we've seen in the past few years is the average loss has increased a lot. A lot of fraud victims now, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars lost. The pandemic is one thing that obviously um, accelerated this process. I also want to ask you about the rise of cryptocurrency. And it's not like cryptocurrency was not available prior to the pandemic, but I feel like 2019, 2020, 2021, around that time, it certainly became more mainstream to the general public. What role does uh, that form of currency play in uh, online fraud? You're absolutely correct. Some of the police investigators I talked to for the story basically talked about cryptocurrency as being the lifeblood of a lot of online fraud. Criminals like cryptocurrency because if you have an internet connection, you can access, buy, and trade crypto. 
The industry is more regulated than it was, certainly more regulated in Canada, but there's little preventing a Canadian citizen from signing up with a cryptocurrency exchange that is overseas that is not well regulated and that can be easily exploited by criminal actors. Could you briefly lay out what an investment scam looks like to someone sitting at their computer? Totally. I actually think the best way to do that is to tell you the story of a victim of an investment scam, if I could. Sure. I spoke with a victim here in British Columbia, a businessman by the name of Ben. He asked us to withhold his full name, partially because of the shame he feels. Ben lost $1.6 million in an investment scam. And it all started with Elon Musk. Ben was on social media one day, scrolling around, and saw what looked like a really convincing video of Elon Musk promoting this new investment opportunity called Braxton Wealth Management. And when Ben went to go check it out, he saw that Braxton Wealth Management purported to be this Switzerland-based company that basically offered online stock and bond trading services. You would put money on the website and then kind of like your bank, you would use that money to invest in various stocks, derivatives, whatever you want to buy. Ben's a pretty cautious investor by nature. He, he, he describes himself as someone who usually only invests in GICs and other pretty safe investment tools. So he started with just $250. Um, and he said that it was incredibly convincing. He had people phoning him from this organization, letting him know how his investments were doing. He was receiving dividends from them. They were actually giving him money back at some points. And so he kept investing more and more and more and putting more of his money in until he was $1.6 million deep. And he believed that those investments were performing marvelously, that everything was okay. Then in April of this year, Ben figured out something was wrong and started to make some calls. And before you know it, Braxton Wealth Management had vanished. Its website was gone. And so was Ben's money. And he learned that his, this money that he thought he was investing in stocks and derivatives, et cetera, had actually gone to a cryptocurrency exchange. And from there, according to a private investigator report that Ben later paid for, moved as many as 200 times across the world and just sort of vanished into the air. And that's sort of what we're talking about with some of these investment scams. They are sophisticated schemes designed to make you put in basically everything you have until the final moment where it's all gone. Maybe can you just explain for... Those of us who have remained mostly blissfully uh, crypto unaware, what people need to understand about why it makes for such a successful fraud currency and what people need to know to avoid getting sucked in? It's a great question. Cryptocurrency can be a legitimate investment tool, but it's also preferred by fraudsters for a number of reasons. One is that if you have an internet connection anywhere in the world, you can buy and receive cryptocurrency. They don't have to deal with the traditional financial system, things like banks, et cetera, that have more safeguards around this. The industry is more regulated than it used to be, but there's not much preventing a Canadian citizen, for example, from signing up for a cryptocurrency exchange and jurisdiction with very lax oversight and using it to send money. Fraudsters love this. The RCMP recently did an internal audit, and they found that the rate of cryptocurrency-enabled crime is up 900% since 2018. And the most common offense that that's related to is fraud. Fraudsters love using this as a tool. In terms of staying safe, the basic advice is that every investment carries risk. And the second question you should ask yourself is, if someone is insisting that you pay for a service or use a service of cryptocurrency, and you're not traditionally a cryptocurrency investor, you should think extremely hard about whether that's a good idea for you. Ask yourself, what do you honestly know about this? Keep in mind that every dollar you put in is a dollar you may never see again. Are you self-employed? Don't think you need business insurance? Think again. Business insurance from Zinsurance is a no-brainer for every business owner because it provides peace of mind. A lot can go wrong. A fire, stolen equipment, or an unhappy customer suing you. That's why you need insurance. Don't let the I'm too small for this mindset hold you back from protecting yourself. Zinsurance provides customized business insurance policies starting at just $19 per month. Visit Zenturance.com today and buy your policy online in just a few minutes. Zenturance, mind your business. 
I'm Abby Sharp, and I'm a registered dietitian on a mission to dismantle diet culture. Yes, that insidious multi-billion dollar business keeping us on a never-ending hamster wheel of hating our bodies, fearing food, and spending our hard-earned money on a seemingly impossible mission to live our best, or more accurately, thinnest lives. On my new podcast, Bite Back with Abby Sharp, I'll be using my signature science and sass to debunk myths, call out the charlatans, and take down the endless barrage of BS bombarding us every day. Tune in each week as I'm joined by guests for expert interviews, engaging conversations, and science-backed information to help you leave diet culture behind for good. Listen on the Frequency Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. You mentioned that um, there's a difference between regulated cryptocurrency in Canada and from other countries around the world. How do you how do you tell the difference? What is the difference? The best way to go about it is to make sure that the exchange that you're dealing with is at least registered in Canada. And I would go further than that. I would make sure that it is a reputable, sort of known and trusted exchange that you're that you're dealing with here. Look for a sort of larger names, for example. Talk to your local securities commission in whatever province you are if you have any doubts whatsoever about the legitimacy of a cryptocurrency exchange. If someone offers you a new exchange and it's based overseas, for example, or if it's very, very new, or if you look up the address, for example, and it's, it's a residential building or just sort of a random office, think very, very hard about when you should invest in that, right? Think, you know, question that a little bit. You should really treat these investments with a, a really high degree of scrutiny. And remember that these are not like traditional banks and the regulations and the protections are not the same as traditional banks. Okay, so all of that said about how this is happening, how you can kind of uh, keep your guard up. How have police adapted to this explosion in this kind of crime? I mean, we're talking about going from 100 million to more than 500 million, and that's apparently the tip of the iceberg. So what's been done in that time? It's been extremely difficult for police to keep up with this, if we're being frank. Uh, officers that I interviewed for this story refer to this as a tsunami of fraud. And they admit very candidly that they are receiving so many case reports that they basically can't investigate a huge amount of them. They have to essentially just turn them down and tell a person there's nothing they can do. I think the important thing to underline here is that unlike a lot of the quote-unquote old-school fraud, which were, those cases were already sometimes hard for police to investigate, with these new cyber cr crimes, police often have very little they can do. If you've been swindled out of your money, it's been turned into cryptocurrency, and it's been sent overseas, that is a months or years long investigation for a lot of police agencies. They have to use software to figure out where your cryptocurrency went, if that police unit even has access to that kind of software, and they certainly won't have fast access to it. They need to write a bunch of production orders to compel different cryptocurrency exchanges to provide money. That's assuming those exchanges are in Canada. Then if the trail leads overseas, Odds are there's a very low chance of arrest, especially if the, if the suspect is not in a jurisdiction that's going to cooperate with Canadian police. So when police look at that picture and they go in with the priority of justice, of, of arresting someone for a crime, they often unfortunately kind of conclude that, look, this isn't worth the resources we put into this. And it's unlikely to actually get what the victim probably wants, which is their money back, right? And that puts police in, frankly, a pretty heartbreaking situation where they're often telling victims who have lost their life savings, who have lost huge chunks of their money, that there's nothing they can do to get it back. And you can imagine the alienation and the frustration that victims feel. You can also imagine the disappointment police feel. Uh, I spoke with a lot of officers in Canada who are hugely concerned about this wave of crime, of uh, fraud, rather. They believe this fraud is driven by organized crime. They believe this fraud is going on to fuel other crimes like drug trafficking and human trafficking. They think it's all interconnected. They think this is a huge priority and they are very frustrated that they don't have more tools at their disposal. When you say they don't have more tools at their disposal, is this a question of resourcing, you know, directing uh, funds from elsewhere to uh, creating more units and uh, more specialists to fight this type of crime? Or is this a consequence of the type of crime itself? And once it gets out of Canada, like it doesn't matter how many cops you throw on the beat, it's gone. 
It's a fantastic question. And the answer is that there is a question of priorities here. When money leaves Canada, when money le- like you know goes overseas, it is a lot harder to recoup any of that, to arrest someone. It doesn't mean it's impossible. There, there have been cases where police or law enforcement agencies have managed to convince cryptocurrency exchanges, for example, to kick some of that money back or to put a freeze on assets they believe are derived from fraud. There are things that police can do, but there's a resourcing problem here. Uh, Police will tell you that nationally, in general, they are struggling to recruit for every kind of position. And fraud is kind of a specialized beast. Right. Being a beat cop won't necessarily prepare you to investigate fraud. You need teams with people like forensic accountants, with lawyers, with people who understand the international financial system. You need access to software that traces cryptocurrency, which we've talked about as kind of the lifeblood of fraud. You know, RCMP estimates a 900% increase since 2018. And frankly, most police don't have those kinds of resources available. And the other problem here, if we're being blunt, and, and police officers I talk to acknowledge this, fraud is not a priority for many police agencies in Canada, for politicians, and for Canadians more general. Um, We do not associate true loss to fraud in a lot of cases. And we don't treat it with the same importance that we might treat, for example, an assault or something that is more tangible in our communities. And a lot of police officers I spoke with say that's actually the wrong way to think about this because there are deaths and there is violence because of fraud. There are tragically people who die by suicide after being defrauded. There are people who seek out revenge on the alleged perpetrators themselves because they feel like police won't do it. And then there's what the money is ultimately spent on. You know, we've talked about the connections to organized crime, the connections to things like drug trafficking. So to think of this as a bloodless crime, I think might be actually erroneous. I think I think it's not true. So we've talked about the police response and police resourcing. Uh, What about at a policy level? Are there changes that we could be making uh, that would better prepare citizens for this kind of stuff or better fortify our own uh, banking systems against it? Like, uh, is there a solution at that level? There is a lot that we could be doing. On the investigation side, from a big kind of top of the tent perspective, Canada has talked a lot about creating a new financial crimes agency, something that the federal Liberal Party has promised in its election platform and that it's, you know, dedicated money to to study, but there's no timeline on when that agency might actually be real. Some investigators I talked with said that would help to have a big umbrella agency in the country that has more of of these resources and has the ability to take some of these cases on. So that's one thing. Another thing that people are doing is education. It's cliche, but the best way to kind of get ahead of these cases is to try and educate the public as much as you can about these scams, about this wave of fraud, so people don't get defrauded. And then there's a set of strategies that the BC Securities Commission refers to as disruption. Basically trying to knock the fraudsters off their game. For example, going after cryptocurrency exchanges that are tools and sort of avenues for fraud going after some people who might help move the assets of fraud around, trying to shut down websites that host fraudulent investment services, for example, or to blacklist those websites from search engine results. I've heard talk about what needs, what social media platforms should be doing and what their responsibility should be in regards to fraudulent information going around, right, on their sites, you know, on their turf, basically. In the United States, a, a former Santa Clara uh, district attorney named Aaron West, who's been leading a really amazing campaign to raise awareness about fraud and to inspire a uh, response from officials, she's talked about this basically as a sort of a novel war. And she's argued that there should maybe even be economic sanctions placed against countries that are kind of the hotbeds of fraud. Uh, So there's a lot in the toolbox that could still be could still be grabbed and used. Last question, then, since a big part of this is education, as you mentioned, um, what should someone who's listened to this or someone who feels that they are equipped to recognize this kind of stuff uh, do to personally educate and help the people around them, um, particularly older or less savvy uh, internet users who may be vulnerable to this kind of stuff? Do we know what message works? I think that the I want to push back on the premise of your question. Okay. Because I think there's a stereotype often that the people who are victims of fraud 
are elderly people and people who, as you put it, are, are less internet savvy. Mm. And, and to some degree, that is true. We know, of course, that elders tragically are very often victims of fraud. But I think a lesson I got from reporting this story is that everyone is vulnerable to fraud. The victims that I spoke to during my reporting were successful business people, established professionals, tradespeople. These are smart, intelligent, savvy people who nonetheless were taken advantage of and lost in some cases their life savings. And I think the message that needs to be put out there is that no one is immune from this and everyone is susceptible to it, no matter how savvy you may think you are. There are some obvious things you should look out for. If someone that you know only from the internet strikes up a relationship with you, tries to push you into investing in something, huge red flag. If you see the involvement of cryptocurrency, generally speaking, often a red flag. You should watch out for that. You should ask yourself, what do I know about this vendor? What do I know about this company? But I think the message that we need to take from this is that this is not a problem just affecting one group of people in our society. And the more we can do to destigmatize it and talk openly about it, I think the more robust our response is going to be. Zach, thank you for all of this. I think it's uh, really important to talk about and uh, very helpful just to educate in general. Thank you for having me on. Zach Veshera, reporting for the Investigative Journalism Foundation. That was The Big Story. For more from us, you can head to our website, which is thebigstory.ca. We will never ask you for any cryptocurrency on that site. Mm, at least not yet. You can also shoot us any feedback you'd like for this episode or any other by writing to hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by calling us and leaving a voicemail at 416-935-5935. The Big Story is on your favorite podcast player and it's on your smart speaker if you ask it to play The Big Story Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.